It's really simple to do it. If we have time left at the end, we'll then take questions from the audience. Quite enough from me already. It's time for our first speaker, and it's Dr. Mary Bowsted. I'm absolutely delighted. Thank you for joining us, Mary. Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union and former secondary school teacher. Thanks, Mary. Thank you very much, Nilas, and I'm delighted to be here. So I'll go straight into, I've got seven minutes, so I'll go straight into answering the question. So the question is, is there a comprehensive future? And uh, so I thought about what a comprehensive future meant to me. I thought that was the first place to start. I'm a teacher and I always tell pupils to answer the question. So I'm answering the question. And uh, my concept of a comprehensive future is one in which children and young people are given through their education and through their life chances, the most equal chance of realizing their potential. If this can happen, then there is a comprehensive future, but we have an enormous amount of work to do to achieve that and things are getting worse. So research by the Education Policy Institute indicates that about 40% of the gap in attainment between advantaged and disadvantaged pupils is set in stone before they start school at five. And by the time the 11 plus entry examination or equivalent is taken, 60% of the disadvantaged attainment gap, which is equivalent to 10 months of learning by this stage has emerged. And the gap widens as children get older. So early years really matter. And if children are born into, or even if they experience poverty for a relatively limited amount of time, then this has real and lasting effects on their attainment at school. And child poverty in the UK is on the increase. 4.1 million children live in poverty. That's 30% of children. So in the average class of 30, take an average class, nine of the children will be poor. Now, my members, teachers, leaders and support staff, tell me repeatedly of the effects that poverty has on children's lives, on their ability to learn. Because if you're cold or hungry or stressed because of something that's happened at school, then it's really, really difficult to concentrate on learning. And 83% of NEU members in a recent survey that we did with the Child Poverty Action Group said they had seen evidence of children's hunger during the school day. And their tales are heartbreaking. Children sharing coats, teachers always having a roll of tape in their desk drawer to tape up summer's shoes in the middle of winter. Uh, one boy in one survey that I really remember recently, who wore his trousers back to front all the time because he didn't want his friends to see the holes in the knees. One respondent wrote of Dickensian levels of poverty and COVID absolutely has shone a light on this level of inequality. So when the government mandated uh, through, um, by law, three hours a day of uh, remote learning for primary school pupils and four hours a day for secondary school pupils, what they didn't match that with was the um, access to the internet or to laptops for the 700,000 children and young people in the UK who don't either have a laptop or access to the internet and how they would engage with remote learning is anyone's guess. I was recently on a programme last week on a television programme with the editor of the Sheffield Daily Star who's got a campaign in Sheffield because 13,000 secondary school pupils in Sheffield, in Sheffield don't have a computer. What COVID has also highlighted is the social function that schools play in supporting parents, safeguarding children, feeding children and so much more. Now, the National Foundation for Education Research in 2018 concluded that schools count for about 9% of pupil level, level variation. And that's something, but that leaves a huge gap. So if we are to be serious about a comprehensive future, we need to be serious about comprehensive entitlements for all children not to be born into poverty. And that means a living working wage for families, good housing, secure food and clothing, and good support services for families, including playgrounds, youth clubs, children's social workers, libraries. We need to be as serious about children's well-being as this current government is serious about sovereignty in the Brexit negotiations. So given that in order for us to have a comprehensive future, you need to have a comprehensive present for children, what do schools need to do to make a difference? And I would say three things. Firstly, it has to be understood that a system based on competition between schools doesn't raise standards for the most vulnerable. And the OECD finds consistently that education systems based on competition and choice end up in, be in being highly segregated. That's true in the USA, 
It's true in Sweden and it's true in England, where school intakes are highly stratified in terms of social class. <laughs> so in our system where there are plus where, where you know there are schools for the working class, schools for the dispossessed and disadvantaged, and middle class schools, it would make sense, wouldn't it, that the schools who've got the most disadvantaged children who have the hardest time when they're young, that they would have the most experience and the best qualified teachers. But that's not true. The Talis survey findings, Teaching and Learning International Service survey run by the OECD in 2020 showed that the most disadvantaged pupils are disproportionately the most likely to be taught by inexperienced teachers and also by teachers who are not qualified in the subject that they're teaching. And you know, this is a big problem. Um, one in five maths and English lessons is taught by teachers who are not qualified in maths and English. And those unqualified teachers in the subject they're teaching are more likely to be taught teaching in disadvantaged schools. And that level of inequality in school compounds children's disadvantage and surely it should be reversed. The second uh, thing that we need to do is we need to keep, schools need to keep deprived and disadvantaged children in education. I'm not arguing for no exclusions. I'm not arguing for that. But the problem is not legal exclusions. The problem is off-rolling. Now, two years ago, the NEU funded the Education Policy Institute to do a major piece of work. They mined the National Pupil Database and they found out the extent to which there is off-rolling in schools. And the extent is really shocking. Uh, nearly 8%, just over 8% in 2017 of the national cohorts in England had been off-rolled. That's illegally excluded. And if you look at the pupils who are being off-rolled, let's look at their characteristics. Uh, they are pupils in social care, pupils who've already experienced an official permanent exclusion or a fixed term exclusion, uh, pupils who are having free school meals, pupils from black ethnic backgrounds, one in eight, and pupils in the lowest quartile for attainment. And I think we can see a pattern here. The pupils who are the least likely to fare well in the performance league tables are the most likely statistically to be illegally excluded from secondary schools. And those who most need their education to compensate for the other life chances that they're locked out of, they're most likely to be unofficially excluded from school. So that has to stop. And thirdly, my final point, we have to reform the current school accountability system, which actively discriminates against schools doing the hardest work, educating the most deprived pupils. And I have in my sights here the school inspector at Ofsted, which sits at the heart of a damaging, uh, vicious accountability regime. So research by Hutchinson in 2016 shows that using a robust measure of school performance based on value-added measures over three years, schools in deprived areas with challenging pupil intakes that make significant gains in performance are disproportionately likely to be judged by Ofsted as needing to be placed in special measures or requires improvement. Conversely, schools in the leafy suburbs with advantaged pupil intakes, which over a three-year period make the same declines in pupil value-added performance, are likely to be judged by Ofsted to be good or outstanding. And Hutchinson concluded that Ofsted is better at judging the characteristic of a school's intake than the quality of the education it provides. But the effect of a poor Ofsted judgment, however invalid and unreliable that judgment is, means that these schools, the disadvantaged pupils, find it more difficult to recruit teachers and qualified teachers. And the pressure on the staff who work in them is immense. They have to cope every day with the reality of poverty on poor children's lives and to be judged unfairly by Ofsted when, uh, when they, uh, the quality of education is improving. So to finish, if we want a comprehensive education system, I would start with these four key reforms. End child poverty, reduce competition between schools, reduce the segregation of pupil intake, really tackle off-rolling and reform school accountability with a new inspectorate, which has the data and the expertise to do this vitally important job well and hold schools to account. And then after that, I would reform the curriculum we form the assessment qualification system because at present our curriculum denies rich learning opportunities to students and our assessment and qualification framework blocks rather than enables their progress. We must be much more ambitious for our students than our test driven system allows us to be. And then I would take legislation through Parliament to ban selection at 11. Thank you. Neither, we can't hear you. Muted, Mila. Serves me right. 
Thanks, Mary. I'll cut it short. Just to note, I did that because I could hear some people in the background. It might be an idea if you're not speaking to mute. And then, of course, to remember to unmute. Can I say thanks for that, Mary? Our next speaker is Danny. Now, Danny is a health of Mackinder, no, I think it is. Anyway, I got pronunciation, tried to get that right. Mackinder, Professor of Geography at Oxford, a leading academic on issues of social justice and inequality. Danny's latest book is Fintopia, What We Can Learn from the World's Happiest Country. Many thanks, Danny. Uh, thank you ever so much. Uh, seven minutes. Finland learned from us, um, which at least is something we can be proud of. In the 1960s, the Finns came to us and actually also went to the United States to look at progressive reforms in education and how to desegregate their schools to create a comprehensive future for Finland. And just to mention, in case anybody doesn't know about Finland and the Finnish education system, it is lauded as being the best in the world in terms of not only the happiness of young people in Finland, uh, but also the outcomes. Can you speak five languages or six? Or if you do well at 18, eight languages, while also being highly numerous and good at problem solving. Um, that's what a comprehensive education gives you. It's not what our divided education gives us. Not even the, the young men who have the most spent on their education achieve what the average Finn achieves. Um, it, it's shocking. We did have a comprehensive education at a particular time. Uh, and that time really was when the comprehensive schools were introduced and shortly after. You can't simply have a comprehensive education on its own. You can't make schooling more equitable, but divide the rest of society up, in particular, by divide people by income, allow some people to become very rich and others become relatively poorer, and for your schools to work. And that's what happened in Britain. Uh, I grew up in Oxford, in this city, and I was very lucky. I grew up at exactly the time when the secondary modern and grammar school divide was ended. I would have failed the 11 plus. I can tell you, I couldn't read and write at the age of eight. I was good at maths, but that wouldn't have been enough. Um, anyway, it didn't matter. So only much later in life, I, I worked that one out because our schools were all comprehensive. And not only were they suddenly become comprehensive, but nobody knew what the good or bad school was. And little diversion about Oxford, but the county grammar, the poshest state school of the entire county, uh, was based down in Littlemore near the car factory in the poorest part of the city. The secondary modern that was most shunned was based in North Oxford in the poshest part of the city. And so you can see when you make them more comprehensive, nobody's quite sure. And what do you do when nobody's sure? Well, you go to the nearest school. And that actually, that, there was a time when that occurred and the effect was incredible. Mary mentioned Sheffield. Uh, for, I'm sure nobody's tuned. Well, maybe some people tune in to this because they want to, to argue. But uh, Sheffield sends more young people to university than Bristol. How does the city of Sheffield send a higher proportion of its young people to university than Bristol? It's because Sheffield has such a better comprehensive education system. Still very divided. There are six comprehensives high up on the hill, uh, which get high, very high results in the posh part of Sheffield in the southwest. Uh, in fact, better results than, than the posh comprehensives in Oxford. How does Sheffield do it when it's still divided? It has hardly any private schools. Whereas Bristol, which has a large proportion of private schools, the effect of that segregation is to actually result in fewer children overall going to university or doing well for Bristol. Segregation actually damages overall chances. Uh, and I won't get into what happens to people who pass the 11 plus with a bit of shoving and pushing and luck, and then spend the rest of their school experience at the bottom of a grammar school. We never think of those. Awful position to be in. Um, we're not in a comprehensive present. Uh, if you look again, you can look nationally, but at my city, the gaps between the exam results of the state schools have never been wider. The gaps in the house prices between the catchment areas of the five state schools in the city of Oxford are about £100,000 each. You pay, pay £100,000 to get between the catchment areas of your state schools. And that's for the two thirds of parents who use state schools. 
a third are using private schools in, in this city of Oxford. Um, it's apartheid. The children of the city don't mix. They don't know each other. They might occasionally play in the same football team. <laughs> but really, um, absolutely shocking. Are we going to get, and how do we get a comprehensive uh, future? We will get one. It's inevitable. It makes so much sense. We are an outlier. We have the greatest educational inequality in Europe. The only question is, how long will it take us to get there? How long will it be before we recognise the damage that's done? Um, before we actually recognise how much more able young people are in those countries that have a comprehensive uh, system. And I think Ma Mary also touched on the biggest problem when she talks about the tests and the national curriculum. What happens with a divided education system like ours is that the pressure on the testing regimes and the curriculum is to make it more and more formulaic so that you can train like a trained dog a young person to get A's or ones, because that's what's being demanded of the school you're paying a lot to. Now, on the international comparisons of ability, our children do worst in Europe, and particularly by the age of 24. And you can all think about this, if you just think about your maths exam, and when you took your maths exam at say 16, what our schools do is train people to either get the equivalent of an A, the highest mark from posh schools, or a C, or the equivalent nowadays from average schools, on the day. That's all that matters. You don't teach them maths, you teach them how to get that grade on the day. For our most able young people, we teach them how to get nine in a nine point question or six in a six point question. What's so terrible about this? They turn up at university without a clue how to use their imagination. Utterly, utterly terrible uh, result. And I can't help thinking that the state that Britain's in today, the fact we're just 20 days away from potentially no deal, a government in utter disarray, a testing regime that doesn't work. I think you can look at our educational system. I wouldn't blame the politicians, I'd blame their schools and how we ended up in this terrible state. If we don't want to be the laughing stock of Europe in 30 or 40 or 50 years time, we need to change our education system to a decent European education system. Uh, we were there at the beginning, we've lost it, we need to go back again. Thank you very much. Nula, you're still on mute. <laughs> I, 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 I had I had it that time. I'm doing really great here, aren't I? I'll just go and get my coat, shall I? Just get my coat. Uh, thank you, Annie, terrific stuff. Sobering, sobering. I'm really gutted. There is, can I just say, there is. there are audience questions asking could we please have those stats, Danny, that you gave us? And if you can think of any, if there's a book, could you put it in chat? And to audience members, if you want to ask a question, mm -hmm. of anything, please put it in the Q and A, not in the chat, questions, and we'll try and get to them. All right, quickly now. Thelma. Thelma is our speaker. Thelma is a former Labour MP for Colm Valley, a member of the Education Select Committee. She's also a former primary school head and her current roles include coordinator for Labour Against Private Schools, and she's a member of the NEC for the Socialist Educational Association. Thanks very much, Thelma. Thank you, Nula, and it's great to join everybody. I'd like, if I may, to share my vision of what I believe a fully inclusive, comprehensive education service could look like, where we are now, and what's preventing us from achieving it. Put simply, I want a good school in every community for every child. I want that good school to be accountable to that community. I want it to be such a good school that it would make the grammar schools and private schools redundant. In my view, a complete structural change has to take place to move from the fragmented education service we have at present. Working in the latter part of my career, in one of the most deprived areas of the country. I've seen, as Mary referred to, firsthand the negative impact of poverty and deprivation on children's achievement, well-being, and life chances. But it doesn't have to be this way. Every child has a right to a good education. And for me, there are three areas which need to reform and reform quickly. Mary referred to these in her speech too, but Admissions, assessment and curriculum have to change 
if we're going to make sure that every child has that good education. So to begin with admissions, a fair, inclusive and accountable admission system would end what we have now, which I refer to as postcode poverty and entrenched deprivation, as opposed to the postcode privilege and entrenched affluence that Danny referred to, which exists across our country. Inequality, as we know, has widened over the past 10 years of austerity and the pandemics exposed and worsened the situation for many. Local children going to their local school in their own community should be the norm. Investment is needed, though, in training for teaching staff, educational psychologists and other support agencies and resources so that SEND children's needs can be met in their local community school. A fully funded, truly inclusive school for every child. That's my vision and dream. Reform to admissions could achieve this. Which brings me to the second area of need of reform, assessment. Reception children aged four and five undergo baseline assessment. And a percentage of those small children Ignoring their family background and past experiences are judged as not having met expectations. At four and five, I think that's heartbreaking. As a head, we had children arriving at our shore start with limited speech, language and communication. Some, heartbreakingly so, didn't know how to hold a book or turn the pages. And yet with trained, dedicated staff, those same children left primary school at 11, able to take part in the school play, stand on a platform, introduce the play, speak, communicate with confidence with their peers, have positive relationships with their peers and with the adults in the school. Their parents were engaging with the school at the end of that time. But the issue was that that wasn't really acknowledged. All that was really acknowledged was the SATS test at age 11, a very narrow, rigid, fact-based test. But those children left primary school enjoying life and enjoying learning. That wasn't really measured or acknowledged. That success and progress wasn't acknowledged. But apart from that, they'd been tested baseline year four and five, at age four and five. Year two, year four, year six, in areas of selection, the 11 plus. All of this, such a narrow, for me, purposeless assessment. And with the 11 plus, where the wealthiest can afford to, to pay for private coaching. With all of this testing, however, there's always a small percentage who are judged as not meeting the expected standard. What about those children? What about their self-esteem? And then when they finish with primary, on to secondary school and the norm reference testing and algorithm unfairness, which we saw the fiasco in the summer, where postcode again disadvantages so many young people. No wonder so many young people have mental health problems and leave school feeling a failure. Currently, the UK is at the top of the international league tables for, I quote, routine memorization and teaching to the test but at the bottom for collaborative and critical thinking. And here's where I think we're going wrong. What is assessment for? Well, for me, it should be informing next steps for teaching and learning, but it's only one part of a child's educational journey. Exams should be one small part of a broad spectrum of project-based learning, coursework, speaking and listening, presenting, along with working collaboratively. Critical thinking and children's agency are so important. Children should have a voice in their learning. Ongoing formative assessment with external moderation across groups of community schools can work. Assessment should help celebrate what children can do, not just judge what they can't. Future employers want these skills too. The third area, which is crying out for reform, and something really important to me is reform of the curriculum. The late great Sir Ken Robinson in, in his report, All Our Futures, 
believe that all subjects are of equal importance with no distinction between academic and non-academic. And I agree with him. Children today are facing a future of climate change, massive unemployment and economic downturn. They need to be skilled up to face the future. Children need also to be emotionally resilient, to be able to make a contribution to their community, to be able to form positive relationships, personal and professional. The curriculum in our schools should reflect the diversity of our society. It should not be a curriculum which has a focus just on exam success, but one which encourages creativity, critical and divergent thinking. Learning is not just about facts and knowledge. It's also about new skills, participation and collaboration, different ways of thinking. And most of all, as Danny mentioned, happiness and enjoyment. Selection through the 11 plus is clearly unfair especially when only about 25% of any cohort can ever pass. Testing a child on one day of their life, a test which will change their life chances and their future, is just plain wrong to me. Grammar schools are mainly populated, let's be honest, by middle-class kids and are not inclusive. It fosters the them and us culture, which people have referred to. Selection fosters social division. It is not, however, just the 11 plus which has to go. Grammar schools and private schools need to be integrated into the state sector. Only 7% of school age pupils are in private education, yet 64% of our front bench went to a private school. And I'll just leave you for a few seconds to think about that um, and, the, and the rationale for integrating private school. <laughs> if a child can play the CPAP, at Eton, then every other child across the country should be able to play the CTAR. There has to be structural and systemic change if we're to win the massive inequality which exists in our society. State schools should be the go-to choice. I believe we're at a watershed moment in education, and it's the teachers and school leaders who need to be leading professionals and progressive policy, making and uh, transforming transformational change in what and how we teach. If we're to truly deliver on a fully comprehensive future for all children, we need to end selection and a system which unfairly favours the affluent and privileged. We need to end narrow, inappropriate, fact-based assessment. We need to deliver a broad and balanced curriculum, review admissions policies and make schools accountable to their local communities. Integrate grammars, academies and private schools, and let's have social justice at the heart of a fully funded national education system. I'll finish with saying, every child has the right to a good education. Ending the 11 plus would be a start. We must end selection, a system which unfairly favors the wealthy and connected. A fully inclusive, comprehensive education is needed. One which delivers a happier, healthier, greener, a more equal society. I believe the public are ready for change. We owe it to future generations to make that change. And if not now, when? Thank you. Thank you very much. I've given up muting everybody. That way I can't go wrong anymore. But thank you, thank you, Thelma, inspiring. Finally, John Burko. Now we all know, I'm sure, I don't need much introduction here, served as Speaker of the House of Commons from 2009 to 2019, and as a Conservative MP for Buckingham from 97 to 2019. John has first-hand experience of selection as an MP in the selective area. I'm saying no more, I'm going to leave it to John. Thank you very much, John. Nula, thank you. It's a pleasure and a privilege to follow Mary, Danny and Thelma, and perhaps almost by way of a plea in mitigation in anticipating what people in your audience and your organization might think. I'd like to start by saying, I got there in the end. I've always been quite a slow learner and a relatively late developer and I've never claimed to be an A brain. I was a, and I'm a B brain at best. And I picked things up through the journey of life's experience, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, in this case, very slowly. But what I'd like to do really to add to the mix 
because there have been three outstanding contributions to date, is to say something divided into three categories, which reflects my own experience and the conclusions I've reached. First, in 1997, when I came into Parliament as Conservative MP for Buckingham, I have shamefacedly to admit to you that I supported what I referred to at the time as the grammar school system, though it should probably more accurately be known as the, in Buckinghamshire they call it, upper schools, the upper school system or the secondary modern system, because that was the dominant feature and is always the dominant feature of a so-called grammar school system. And I supported it for reasons of ideology, of constituency, but not of evidence. I was right wing, I was Thatcherite, I sucked from that cup and instinctively I thought, well, I should support the grammar schools. Why? Well, because they are models of excellence and of achievement. And in my constituency, there was side by side a grammar school, the Royal Latin School, and the upper school, or what you would know colloquially as the secondary modern school. And there was overwhelming focus locally on the grammar school, the local establishment, which was mainly Tory, was very pro the grammar school and focused upon it and designed to celebrate it. And I have also to say that without wanting to disparage or be pejorative about anybody, but in case you're from outside and thinking, well, how could this be, given that three quarters of the kids weren't going to go to the grammar school, they were going to go to the secondary modern school, there was an atmosphere of passivity and of what I can only really describe as quiescence towards the status quo. There were strong articulate supporters of the status quo, the selective system. And then I think in centrist and left of centre circles, there was just a sort of resigned acceptance that this was the norm. And so partly because I was a right wing Tory, even though I haven't been to a grammar school myself, I identified with the grammar school and they made a beeline for me as soon as I was selected as candidate, partly for reasons of constituency pressure, I backed it. But it certainly wasn't based on evidence and I didn't frankly give anything like as much thought as I should have done to how relatively poorly the secondary modern schools were doing, not because of their fault, but because of the structural impediments to them doing any better. The sort of inbuilt bias in funding terms, in terms of recognition, in terms of priority that they were suffering. That leads to my second point. And this is part of folklore in many conservative circles, perhaps not in all, but in many, and perhaps even in most. The notion of the grammar school as the facilitator of the capable, dedicated, working class child, the means by which this person can climb the ladder and get on. Well, I don't know, and probably Danny and Mary and Thelma will tell me, that they do know. I don't know whether that was ever the case, but I certainly don't think it's the case today. And I shifted my thoughts about grammar schools over a period, to be honest, as my views moved politically leftwards, which might be an unusual journey, but it's an authentic and an honest one. And I thought, well, I just don't think that's true where I observe the grammar school. I respect the staff there and they're totally committed, but 18 and a half percent plus of the pupils at the local grammar school actually come from the private sector before they go there. 25 to 30 percent of the pupils come from out of county. Thelma made the point that let me underline it, huge numbers of kids are coached and coached and coached within an inch of their lives to get into the grammar school. And that, let us be clear, is overwhelmingly a middle class prerogative, because the idea that parents who are struggling to put food on the table or to pay their bills and to get by can even contemplate the notion of expenditure on coaching is wholly unrealistic. 2% of kids at the Royal Latin 
are on free school meals. I think it's more like three and a half percent if you use the wider measure of the pupil premium. But that compares with 19 percent at the Buckingham School nearby, a real visible, observable, dislikable apartheid between two schools adjacent to each other and paying homage to different values. But that's a huge difference between the socioeconomic makeup of the grammar and of the secondary modern school. And the attainment gap between free school meals children in Buckinghamshire and non-free school meals children is 39%, which is about three times the level of the attainment gap in nearby Luton. So it's not a fair system. These are predominantly middle-class enclaves, and we shouldn't perpetuate the myth that they're great working-class facilitators. They're not. But I've made a sort of negative critique of grammar schools to which I have become opposed. What is to be said for comprehensives? Others have focused on how the comprehensives could be better in great detail, I won't, and very powerfully. I won't presume to do that now. I just want to make the point that I think as a matter of principle, we should say 11 is too early to select. And it's not even always 11, it's sometimes 10 at which the test is taken. Now, I've no memory of taking the 11 plus, Nuna, but if I took it, I must have failed it. I don't bear any scar or resentment. You're in a good club, John. You're in a very good select club. I think I just wasn't put forward by the head teacher and other students were. So be it. I was a late developer, but I did end up going to Essex University and getting a first class degree. And I don't have any resentment about not going to grammar school at all. More relevantly, our eldest child, Oliver, who's just turned 17, did okay before secondary, but I am very uncertain that he would have passed the 11 plus. He wasn't doing anything like as well then as he is now. He's now in year 12 at Holland Park Comprehensive. And he's got 11 GCSEs, 10 at grade nine, and he's doing fantastically well. And he's not purely swatting or focused on academe. You know, he's a qualified football referee. He takes part in after school activities. You know, he's got many other strings to his bow. He has progressed wonderfully at a comprehensive school, which reflects the diversity and richness in its broadest sense of our capital city. Yes, kids from very expensive houses in Holland Park and kids living in North Kensington in the shadow of Grenfell. That school with a fantastic head teacher, sound pedagogy, brilliant leadership team, is ambitious for all the children in the school. It's a diverse school and it's an inclusive school. And that seems to be far preferable to having, you know, what is not diverse and not inclusive, but exclusive and narrow. And dare I say, almost snobbery infused mentalities. I think snobbery infused mentalities across education are far too prevalent. And some people say, and they said what I wrote an article in The Guardian recently, well, you know, John's deluded if he thinks all comprehensive schools are like Holland Park. Holland Park is different. Well, that may be, but we still come back to the question, what justification is there for selecting at the absurd age of 11 for lobbing all so-called clever children, they're not necessarily in one place, creaming off the best pupils and then saying to everyone else, that's the lodestar, that's the symbol of excellence, that's the beacon to which you should aspire and if you can't, you're second best. I believe that the best comprehensive schools can offer fantastic opportunities for people at the bottom of the pile in socioeconomic terms or who start with disadvantage and for people in the middle without in any way sacrificing the pursuit of the best opportunities and the most outstanding outcomes for the people who are perhaps most gifted or who develop most early. And it seems to me that combination of educational quality and social justice is the principal ambition of the comprehensive model and it's a good model but I will conclude by saying you won't win public opinion round any time soon in selective areas by simply leaflet campaigns or public meetings or the attempted power of persuasion. We don't have 
the right to have individual local energy policies or individual totally local national health service policies. There may be local commissioning, but there's a national model. And I think it's perfectly legitimate and right to say there should be a national approach to education. And the political parties should be challenged to be open and candid and honest and embrace a comprehensive model, nationally devised, nationally applied, and nationally monitored. If you say that's a sort of centralist approach to the achievement of comprehensive education across the board, I plead guilty to that. But hanging around and procrastinating and working on the basis that it can just be achieved at local level uh, is, I think, a pipe dream. And one of these days, I will attempt, as I'm sure colleagues will understand, to overcome my natural shyness and reticence and to tell you what I really think. Oh, brilliant, John. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. So much I could say, but I mustn't. It's not my turn to do it. Oh, absolutely great. Well, wow. Thank you so much, everybody. Now we're going to get to the... We're having to march on. Um, we've got John Edmonds, who's going to ask Mary Bowster a question. And then I'll just run through it quickly so you're all ready. Melissa Benn will ask Danny a question. David Chater will ask Thelma Walker. And Fiona Miller will ask John Burko a question. Now, they are all former chairs of Comprehensive Future. So, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. It's a friend. Come on, we're friends here. You can see what we're like. Uh, Joe is going to be kind of whatever you do, you elevate people up to the panel so that they can be seen and they're going to ask questions. So the first question, are we ready? And it will be John asking Mary Bowster. Thanks, John. Well, let's start with an and take Danny's point that uh, comprehensive education in the end is inevitable. Let's say we've moved on from the present stage and the politicians are engaging in the question of a really comprehensive system. The question that then comes up, of course, and which we've confronted in Comprehensive Future is what happens to the grammar schools? I mean, a lot of suggestions as to how grammar schools should be phased out. Maybe each year, each new year should be, have a full unselected intake. So the grammar school gradually changes into a comprehensive. Other people have suggested the grammar schools should be sixth form colleges. And there've been even suggestions that the grammar schools should be turned into education resource centers. But we do have to have a, an answer to the question, what is going to happen to the grammar schools? Is that your not question to Mary? Is that your question to Mary? That's my question. Um, well, I think that all the suggestions you made, John, are possibilities. Um, I think you've answered your own question. Um, uh, I, 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 I so so any all, any and all of those things could happen to grammar schools. They could be they could become mixed ability. Uh, they could become sixth forms. Um, when 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 Bolton, which is where I grew up, it, it it went comprehensive after I finished school my schooling. But some of the grammar schools became private schools, and others became mixed ability comprehensives. Um, uh, and you know. So, so a, a number of things could happen to them. Uh, I, th I think, though, that the issue that John raised in his talk adds to my thoughts about that, because persuasion probably isn't going to do it. Uh, you know, whilst we have a system where it's the parents of the uh, children in the area where there are grammar schools have to vote to um, abolish that, um, then that is a really big, a big job that they that, that has to be done to persuade them to do that under the current legislation. I do think there's one way of doing it, however. I do think that there is a very strong uh, uh, commitment to fairness in amongst British people. The one thing they don't like more than anything else is things being unfair. And I think John's uh, point about actually grammar schools on, you know, the way that the way that the proponents of grammar school argue is they say 
you know, these are very good schools for the best and brightest of our children. Uh, there is quite a lot of research which actually shows that, as John said, disproportionately, the children in grammar school are the ones whose parents can afford to pay for the coaching. When I, when I went to, um, when I took my daughter to, we, we moved from Yorkshire to London when she was 10 and she went from a fully competitive system to Kingston and Kingston has grammar schools. Um, uh, and uh, I remember her taking her when she was starting year five in September to her new school, just around the corner from our house and uh, dropped her off. I went away, you know, crying. She went into school crying. We were both, you know, was she going to be okay going to this new school at this time? And as I was leaving, um, four, four women stopped me separately, two together and two separately and said, oh, we know that you're just starting the school. Do you want the uh, telephone numbers of the, um, the, the, the coaches who can coach her in the Farhad 11 plus? And when I said, well, no, I don't want that because she won't be doing the 11 plus. Um, they were just utterly astounded that my daughter would not be doing the 11 plus. They were astounded by it. And um, one of them actually said to me, I know prizes are very, very expensive. I said, they are very expensive. They are. That's not the reason why I'm not, she's not doing the 11 plus. So I do think that, um, and there has been some research on this, how much you have to pay to get into the coaching and that how, how severely the kids are coached. And then what many teachers in grammar schools will tell you is actually there are many children in grammar schools who come along and who for whom that education is completely um, unviable because they've been overcoached. And the second argument, which I think is powerful, is not just that the wrong pupils get in, if you can say the right and wrong pupils, but wrong in relation to that 11 plus test is that in areas where there are grammar schools, and it's something that follows on from what John said as well, the gap between um, those who've gone to, you know, those who go to grammar schools and those who don't, the wage differential in those areas is greater than in other areas of the comprehensive intake. So, so that, that differential lasts throughout life. It's those sorts of arguments that we need to make. It's not the brightest and the best who will get the 11 plus, and the effects of this segregation are lifelong. But I agree, it's a really difficult nut to crack. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Okay, our next question is Melissa to Danny. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, so my question picks up some of the themes that have been raised by speakers at different times, and actually also a kind of uh, John's recent or relatively recent conversion. And it's this if you look over the last 10 years, or even longer, there has been a definite shift by conservatives, small c and big c, towards all ability schools. So a good example of that, which John mentioned in his article in The Guardian, was David Cameron saying, we've got to stop going on about grammar schools. And actually Michael Gove and his free school movement was all about all ability schools. So in one sense, you can see that as a prog progression. But on the other hand, it's gone hand in hand with an absolute neo-traditionalism around discipline, curriculum, uniforms, and this idea that good all ability schools mimic the private schools and the grammar schools of old. So my question to Danny, who actually started with a reference to Finland, which is such a different model of comprehensive education, is do you think this is inevitable and maybe part of the journey towards a comprehensive future that we go through this very traditionalist phase and there is evidence that parents like it and in fact the conservative party now and groups like public first who are polling you know parents and kind of confirming that but that's part of their ideology saying parents do like that is it an inevitable part of the journey or could we still and should we now be making arguments for more innovative education more of the kind that we did see in the 60s and 70s which was a very different period and which i think creates a better and richer education so that's my question well i mean a great thing is is that we can test this by comparing countries and seeing what works uh, it's the united states that has this kind of disciplinary system no speaking hands behind your back military kind of schools that we've copied uh, the united states is is a country where people actually do even worse at things like maths we test them at 24 than we do so we've copied we've managed to find somewhere we had to go out of europe and find somewhere to copy that does worst 
Oxford has one new school in the last uh, 50 years, I think, our first school, secondary school, it's a free school. Uh, they have to wear a particular uniform, they must walk and not go any faster, hands behind backs, and, and so on. It's, it's near to my house. Um, very sad, I would say. I, I don't want to wish it badly, but, um, but you know, it's a sign of, of going backwards. Um, of course, in Finland, no uniforms. Head teachers are at first shocked when they're taken into a Finnish school. Uh, the way that children sit around and so on. It takes them some time to, to realise uh, that this works. And also not wearing shoes in school, which they do in New Zealand as well, it has to be said, but uh, for different reasons, it's just nice and warm. Um, but just coming back to this learning issue um, and conservative small C and big C moving away from grammar schools, I think is really interesting. Uh, I think that grammar schools are our are, are worst kind of school in England. And actually worse than the most expensive and elitist pri pri private schools, worse than other things. And the reason for this is that they've selected 11 year olds together on the basis of a supposed intelligence test. What then happens is that these 11, 12, 13 year olds, it's like Brave New World. They're told that they're special. They're told that they're clever. They're told that they're different. I go and do many, many talks in schools now all by Zoom. Um, the most vicious questions I get, and this is on average, the kind of survival of the fittest questions, the, the questions that imply how little the young people think of others are from state grammar school pupils. Mm -hmm. I get nicer attitudes and questions from very expensive private schools. And I, the last school I would ever let any of my children near would be a grammar school because it teaches you from that selection that there are alpha beta delta gamma children and that you are one of the alpha children and other of your society are subnormal compared if you like to you it's a terrible terrible thing to do to children and we don't do enough this is and on we don't we don't do enough to talk about the harm that we create through our segregated system to the children who go to the grammar schools and the children who go to private schools uh, lastly remember Many, many children who go to private schools have failed a test. They failed a test to go to the selective private school. It can happen at the age of four or five. And they, they're in effect, their parents are paying for them to go to a posh secondary modern. And they grow up with a feeling of failure because they couldn't quite get into the poshest private school in town. And I know some of my left wing friends will say, how can you have um, pity for well off people? But it's, it's all very, very sad uh, compared to, and uh, not just Finland, Germany, where you just, you know, and I know they do divide later in Germany, but it's not done in the same, the same way. And it, this creates a dislocated society. And if you're dislocated from your peer group in childhood, it's very hard for that not to re-emerge again and again in the rest of your life. And we've just got to get away, away from this. Brilliant education is not harmed by sitting next to typical people in a classroom. It, it doesn't dull your ability later to do anything. Um, we've got to get people away from that fear uh, that their children's future will be damaged if they actually go to school with children who also live on the same street as them. Thanks, Danny. Sobering, isn't it? Mm. It must be the only country that feels like that. <clears throat> anyway. Our next questioner, former chair of Comprehensive Future, is David Chater, and he's going to ask a question of Thelma Walker. Hey, David. Yeah. Uh, hi, Thelma. Thank you very much for an extremely interesting presentation, and thanks to all the, all the speakers. It's been a, a fascinating evening. I want to ask you about curriculum reform, and particularly the question of the 14 to 18 phase. You'll remember that the last Labour government rejected the recommendations for essentially a 14 to 18 baccalaureate put forward by the Tomlinson Committee. But in recent years, there's been, I think, a revival of interest in this. So my question to you is, what's your view on the concept of a distinct 14 to 18 phase with an integrated and flexible curriculum. 
And if we did have that, what on earth would the point of high stakes testing at the age of 11 and the age of 16 be? Wouldn't this be the easiest way to eliminate selection at 11 particularly and avoid all the pressures and controversies around the GCSE? Thanks very much for your question, David. And yeah, probably listening to me earlier about what I feel about the reform that's needed to the curriculum, a broad and balanced curriculum. Um, and I mentioned also that many of our young people are not prepared for life or the world of work. Um, and the Tomlinson report, I think the recommendations, um, I agree with you, should have been implemented. And I don't feel that we've ever got vocational education right. We've always had this two tier system, um, almost a stigma um, about the, uh, the young people who, who chose the vocational route. Um, and the, the curriculum, sometimes due to, to austerity and budget cuts, is becoming narrower and narrower, narrower at a time when actually if we look at the future and the world of work and how it's going to change, um, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a visit I was privileged to take part in with the Education Select Committee to Stuttgart and Zurich a year last November. Um, and I saw there the success of their uh, co-education dual schooling um, where vocational education choosing choosing to go into engineering or whatever wasn't seen as a, as a lesser qualification um, as opposed to the academic route um, and the students there were 30 percent of academic study and 70 percent with work placement but this was backed by business um, and the federal state. So the funding went in there to support that. But there was no stigma. What I sensed very strongly was, and there was flexibility. So a young person could move from an academic course at one, for one year back into the vocational course. There was flexibility, so there was room for change. Um, and those young people were being equipped um, for the future, for the world of work, and given lots of autonomy and independence as well. We're missing out on this. And even if I look at locally where I am here in Huddersfield in Yorkshire, if, if you look at by 2030, the stats I have is that 27% um, of the, the jobs that are now, you would say NVQ level one and two, won't exist because AI and digital will be doing those jobs. So what are those, what are those young people going to be doing when those jobs go? Um, we're not training up for, for future workplace, or I don't think giving, giving young people that choice of a broad and balanced experience at school. Um, and, and we do need to get rid of this snobbishness um, of, of the academic route has to be superior because it doesn't. Um, and so I, you know, I, I completely agree with you. And I know that the members of the NEC with the SEA um, um, feel the same too. And we'll be working um, with their regular meetings with the Shadow Secretary of State for Education um, to raise this um, in future discussions as well. So thank you for the question, David. Thank you very much, Thelma. Thank you. Finally, we have Fiona Miller, another former chair of Comprehensive Future, and she's going to ask a question of John Burko. Thanks, Fiona. Hello, John. It's very nice to see you. And I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everybody when I say we miss you from the political day-to-day -day cut and thrust, but it's nice to welcome you to the converted. Um, I, I think I agree with your main point, which I thought you were saying that this is more than a matter for local reform. It's uh, it needs strong political leadership at a national level. So my question to you is, what would it take for the Conservative Party to abolish the 11 plus? I think it would take a lot under its present leadership. Because I did not get the impression, Fiona, that the Prime Minister has focused on this subject or has any great interest in it. I think the challenge is that at the moment the bandwidth for subjects other than Brexit and tackling COVID is in a sense almost inevitably limited to a degree and it's even more limited 
if there isn't a thirst to learn. And I don't sense that the Prime Minister has any great thirst to learn. In a way, it's an irony, because I haven't got the stats in front of me, but over the last couple of decades, just as a reflection of societal change, more and more Conservative MPs have gone to state schools. OK, there's still a heavy concentration of very privileged people at the highest level, but more and more Conservative MPs have gone to state schools. And in that sense, there's been a gradual elision almost, or moving together between the Labour side of the House and the Conservative side of the House. You know, that enormous social divide that used to exist doesn't quite exist. But I just don't get the impression that the Prime Minister is particularly interested in the subject. So I think what you need is catalysts within the governing party for possible change. And that doesn't necessarily mean having a huge number, but at least starting with a sprinkling of people who are prepared to think afresh. Now, I don't know. I don't know whether somebody like Robert Halfon, who you know is quite a, an independent-minded character and whose background as chair of the Education Select Committee will, will be well known to people, you know, would be prepared to embrace the issue. But I think that you you need some conservatives who are prepared, as to be fair, David Cameron did, and I'm no fan of David Cameron, but he did stand up and say, look, we must stop, just as he said, we must stop banging on about Europe. I mean, we saw how that turned out. <laughs> but he did say, we must stop banging on about grammar schools as though they're sort of the touchstones of all that's virtuous, when in fact, nothing of the kind is the case. And, and yet I don't really sense it in recent times, if anything, one of the worst developments, which I describe or referred to on passant in my article in The Guardian, was when Theresa May all of a sudden embraced the idea of increasing the number of grammar schools. Colleagues, I can tell you, because I served in her team 20 years ago, that at the time I was very, very pro-grammar school and wanted to bang on about them all the time. And she always wanted the issue to be kept sort of off the radar quite rightly, because she thought, well, we've got to talk about schools more widely. So as I said in my article in The Guardian, she, she was right then and she's wrong now, and I was wrong then, but I think I'm right now. So I think you've got to get a nucleus of Conservatives prepared to take the issue up. But, you know, as far as the Labour Party is concerned, if I may say so, I mean, Thelma will have her own view about this. My view is that the Labour Party ought to take a bolder position and just say, you know, we believe as a matter of principle that selection is wrong and therefore by one or other route, and Mary said in response to John Edmund's opening question, well, there are several possibilities, we are going to get that. I would have thought that saying thou shalt from X year take a fully comprehensive intake would be the most straightforward and direct way of doing it. But I, I think that, you know, the major parties shouldn't fight shy of it and keep ducking it on the basis that they might upset a proportion of parents. You know, you'll always upset a proportion of people if you do anything. But, you know, Tony Crossman did take a stance 50 years ago. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have the network of comprehensive schools we have today. So I think it's time for a little bit of bold, not sheepish thinking. And that thinking then to be translated into action. And bear in mind, the vast majority of kids don't go to grammar schools. So the idea that it's a huge electoral risk for a progressive party to say, on principle, we're going to forge this path, seems to me to be excessively neurotic. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I, I wondered if I could just, I, really, we have time to end, but I wondered if I could just come back to some point. I hope people don't mind. But John, you talked about a national approach, I see it as central, centralised approach to running our education system. And I, I got what you were saying there. In a way, it might be easier to get rid of all these local differences. But I do feel, and Selma's made the point, and certainly others have made the point here, Danny as well in his own way, doing different things about comprehensive schooling, that you need local accountability. You do need to serve your local community. And I, I'm worried that even though that's a really great, I get the idea. I wanted, sorry to pick on you, but would you mind elaborating on that? Because I do think the local community needs to be recognized in schooling. In the schooling we offer. 
Yeah, well, I mean, if there has to be a new mechanism for securing that accountability, you know, that's something that Comprehensive Future could usefully debate. Because I think the trouble is, Nuna, if you just think in terms, let's say, of Buckinghamshire County Council, you know, which is the education authority for Buckinghamshire, albeit that lots of schools are now academies, well, you know, there are considerable and powerful local leaders and opinion formers, and they're not in favour of change. And so I think you have to consider, well, what other form might that local accountability take? Mm -hmm. And off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure how you fashion the instrument mm -hmm. of local accountability, but it seems to me that it's got to be something that reflects the lived experience of the majority rather than the lived experience of the minority. I'm not sure that you get the accountability first and then make the change. I think sometimes you just have to be bold and say, you know, we stood for election as a political party saying that we would do comprehensivization as a matter of national policy and remove grammar schools. And that is what we are going to do and you take the plunge in the first instance, and then you try to build systems of local accountability and local buy-in or purchase, if you like, as you go on. But I think if you spend all the time trying to devise a sort of perfect accountability mechanism by committee, you know, then I don't know what the theological definition of eternity is, but I think it will be eternity before we end selection. So I'm sorry if that sounds rather sort of dogmatic, and perhaps it is slightly dogmatic, but for too long, the dogmatism of a minority has been allowed to prevail. And, you, you know, I, I, I suppose probably 709 is not the time to get philosophical, and I'm hesitant about doing so in front of a distinguished academic uh, like Danny. But the point about selection is that it's not a self-regarding act, as John Stuart Mill would have said. It's a it's another regarding act. It doesn't, it's all very well for people to say, well, you know, parental choice of grammar schools, but actually it's not really the, the parents choosing the grammar school, it's the grammar school choosing the pupils. Mm -hmm. and, and in any case, you know, the effects ricochet mm -hmm. across the system and they affect everybody else. And I suppose that's the real point that the selective system basically prioritizes the 25% over the 75%. And I think we've got to, to take an approach that prioritizes the 75% and says there's no reason why the 25% needs suffer. They can do perfectly well within comprehensive schools as all the best comprehensive exemplars across the country can very eloquently demonstrate. So I, just, I, I just agree with John on that. I just gonna ask you to come in actually, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now just to say, imagine that a few counties like, I don't know, Kent and Essex and Buckinghamshire, had kept their charitable hospitals from before 1948. And if, you know, if the charity trustees said it was okay for you to see a doctor, you could. We wouldn't be arguing that it's, you know, it's in the, the democratic right of Kent to carry on in the Stone Age or not. You know, we'd, say, we'd say you've got to sort it out in the modern uh, system. They've created so many myths about, about these schools being good. Um, to, you know, and also they're playing on hopes and fears. You know, what you do is you, is you, you, parents think their children will do well, hope they'll do well. It's brilliant. 80% of mums think their children are going to go to university, which is not the only thing you have to do. Um, and that's how they keep the support for grammar schools because of, of optimism about the future. Uh, so really it is something I agree with John has to be sorted out nationally. The damage is so great um, from this particular division in the, in the state, uh, sector it is not benefiting the country and it is not benefiting the children who you even think it is benefiting and at that point you've got to pull a rug from under it uh, i do hope labor can be more pragmatic uh, on that uh, other diversity in education i'm very in favor of I, I don't want a completely stalinist system um but grammar schools in particular are so damaging uh, for so many ways uh, that they should be the priority to, to, to go first. Thank you, thank you. I feel since we've given the, the chaps a chance, and I'm not going to be gendered about this, but I am going to say to Mary and Thelma, is there anything else you'd like to pick up on? Would you like to address, would you like to expand on, or perhaps you'd like to say finally, just before I wrap it up, 
Shall I start with Mary and then Thelma? Yeah. Mary, thank you. thank you. Finally, I have to go. I've got to do a television interview about mass testing of all pupils in London I'm and two other boroughs. So uh, just to say thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you to the other members of the panel. And um, we shall meet again in happier times when we don't have to do everything by Zoom. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thelma, you're, the floor is yours then. Yeah, yeah. And just to say the same as Mary, it's been a great turn. And, um, and, you know, you just hope that through this pandemic, we've, we've all said that inequality has been exposed. It was there before, after 10 years of austerity. But, um, but this last year, um, on what everybody's been going through, I think has changed our society. And even though there's been such horrific things that people have gone through, and especially our youngest, I, wor I worry about the most. But you know, out of adversity, I think I think green sh shoots can grow and change can be brought about. And I think people are having the conversations about not going back to how it was. And you know, how it could be in education could grow from this awful year that we've all had, where people are saying change is needed and that inequality that exists needs to be addressed. And this discussion we've had tonight is a starting point. Um, but I'm a born optimist and I hope that out of this terrible pandemic that we can see change and positive change. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to wrap it up. I'm just going to say lots of very persuasive, very good arguments. I'm not going to try and summarize them all, but I will say some things that I will take away tonight. It is a child's right to have an education, to have a good education, but also to give happiness. I think it's an undervalued quality in schooling that children should be able to enjoy education. They should be happy. And by the way, can I say also, don't laugh at me, but one of the most moving academic papers I ever wrote was about the quality of kindness in teachers. And when you unpick that kindness, it was a socially just approach to every child, to be able to look after the needs of every child. And kids called it kindness. So happiness, kindness, social justice. And just because there was one negative there, Mary pointed out the viciousness of illegal exclusions. These are the sort of things we have to think about. That's not giving you a future for comprehensive education. I understand that. But I just wanted to say those were some really very big ideas for me, as well as all the other things. And John's conversion is perhaps, gives me hope, put it this way. If John can be converted, I think we've got a great convert on side, by the way. So I'm really, we want more of you, John. But it is a really <laughs> good sign that with, with experience, thinking, compassion, and a tiny bit of brain matter, you know, selection is wrong. You do not have to justify this. You don't need to. It's just wrong because too many young people lose out from it. I'm going to say good evening. I'm going to say thank you so much to, to Thelma, to David, Mary, who's gone, and to Danny. Thank you very much indeed for a really wonderful talk. I, I've been uplifted and you've given me lots to think about. I hope we meet again and I hope it's in a room in person. Night, night, everybody. And thanks again to all the audience. Thank you very much.